Welcome to the Knowledge for Men show. Your life will never be the same. Your level of success will seldom exceed your level of personal development. I want to die empty of regret. I want to die empty of my best work. We don't understand who we are. Instead, we're living out somebody else's narrative. What one man can do, another man can do. If it's been done, it can be done again. Being yourself and being your truest, most authentic self in every moment. If it scares you or makes you a little afraid, do it. Follow your heart and your gut. The first stage. I think it's finding you, like finding out who I am today. Stuff will not work. You will have things that fail. Success is when you're a happy, fulfilled person. How do you define success? It's your life, and you are the creator of the movie script that is your life story. All right, guys, welcome to the show. I'm here with MJ DeMarco. He's an entrepreneur, investor, self-made multimillionaire, and international best-selling author of the classic book. I think it's a cult classic book here, uh, The Millionaire Fastlane. He sold over, uh, I believe, 2 million copies of The Millionaire Fastlane, mostly self-published here. And his latest book here in my hands, Unscripted, Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Entrepreneurship is now available on Amazon. MJ, welcome to the show. Hey, Andrew. Thanks for having me. All right. And was I right about that? Two million sold? Of the no, 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 no. About two, three million in sales. In sales, in sales. All right, all right, all right. So that's, that's probably about, mm, I want to say a half million. All right, all right. There it is. Okay, yeah, glad we got that there. Let's dive in now with the favorite success quote or a saying that you've lived by that's helped you on your journey. If you accept conventional wisdom from conventional people living conventional lives, can you expect to be anything but conventional? How has this played a role in your journey? Well, when you think about it, we're not educated by people who are living rock star lives, people who are living their dreams. We're, for the most part, educated by a system that is a dream crusher. We're educated by a system that, you know, from the time you're, I don't know, seven, eight years old, your dreams start getting crushed. You're put into an educational system that teaches you You know, Monday through Friday is for doing things you'd rather not do, and then Saturday and Sunday is for you. And we go through that for what, you know, 18 years, and then once you graduate college, you're put into that same identical system. So the education system is not set up to to have us, you know, live our dreams or do what we want or, or do work that we really enjoy. And I think that's a shame. And that's kind of what my new book is about, about how society has a scripted to follow a predictable path that ultimately leads to uh, mediocrity. Mm. And so it sounds like we're not being educated by people who have the results, the life that we want. Sure. I mean, that's that's exactly right. I mean, if, if you're looking to aspire beyond the nine to five, Monday through Friday, let's watch some football games on the weekend and then let's repeat for 50 years, the education system is going to teach you that. And there's there's so many other things involved with that as far as normalizing certain behaviors as if, you know, like a 30 year mortgage, that's normal. Uh, Monday is for work. That's normal. There's uh, invest with the stock market for 50 years. Be frugal because, you know, if you wait 50 years, you eventually become a millionaire and then you can live your dreams. That's the standard doctrine or the script that is being fed to everyone. And it's it's non-consensual. You don't consent to it. It's automatic and it becomes a part of your programming. And people don't really step out of that to see, hey, wait a second. You know, I don't need to be doing this. There's a different way to go about life. And that's uh, kind of been my philosophy since I started writing. So are you against the current education system? Yes and no. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not against education for people that want that education. There are plenty of people that want to become doctors and engineers. And we need, we absolutely need the education system for that. But there's a certain tiny subset of people that are like, you know, I got an art history degree. What am I going to do with this? And they get out of college and they have $90,000 in debt and they find themselves working at Starbucks, you know, a job they could have could have had straight out of high school. So I'm not for or against college. I am against massive debt, unrestrained debt 
for the sole purpose of getting an education which does not guarantee you a job. A college degree doesn't guarantee you to any job whatsoever. And yet they're, they're issuing these things as if there's unlimited jobs. And that doesn't even go into the fact that entrepreneurs and businesses are like the redheaded stepchild of society now. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like society loves babies, but they hate mothers. I mean, that's in effect the business, uh, the cantankerous business to a job relationship there is right now. Okay. Yeah, that answers that. So if someone needs to get the right education, then you know, for a specific job role, then do so. But, you know, myself, I had a degree in social science, which I don't, <laughs> I don't yeah. know, but it is one of those degrees where everyone's like, oh, well, what are you going to do? And it's like, you're, in, well, I was in a similar position when I graduated to when I first graduated high school. When I graduated college, I was mm -hmm. kind of confused. When I graduated high school, I was still, you know, I was, I was confused too. <laughs> so what is the script that most people are living on? Like, like how, do, what does this look like if, if we play the life and we fast forward from, from let's say college all the way until death, what, what does that script look like? Well, the, the script is basically as soon as you enter into education, the script begins. And I mean, we're talking five or six years old. Okay. Now, if, if you think about it, when you were, when you were a child, your, your parents were like, well, you can be anything you want to. You, you, whatever you can set your mind to, you can do. And then suddenly something changed. You know, get realistic. You can't do that. You know, that's, that's, you, you need to get a job. You need to go to college or well, you need to get good grades. And the script is a series of hyper realities that everyone lives by and they don't actually question those hyper realities. So a good example is since we've been talking about yeah. going into school is Monday through Friday. You know, there is no celestial reason for a seven-day work cycle or a Monday through Friday. It, there's no celestial reason for it. It's a human-created construct to create order. So if aliens were coming to the planet and they, and they analyzed the planet, they would say, okay, so one day is 24 hours and one year is 365 days. But Monday through Friday, Saturday, Sunday, that kind of thing, name days, plays no role in that. Your dog doesn't know the difference between a Sunday or a Tuesday. It's all the same, except for humans, because we've created that construct. So the construct we are taught, as soon as we get into that kindergarten, five years old, is we are taught Monday through Friday is for the system, and Saturday and Sunday is for you. And the sad thing about that is, that's a negative rate of return. Right. That's not an interest payment. You don't get that time back. It's gone. So if someone approached you in finance and said, hey, you know, give me $5 and after a couple of days, I'll give you two, but you're not going to get your $5 back, you would reject that flat out. Right. And yet people, I mean, these are the type of hyper realities that the script is promoting. And we're trying to get people to acknowledge these types of things so we can step out of those and build something different that is outside of the script. Mm -hmm. And so it, it sounds like you sacrifice five days in order to enjoy two, but really it's not two because Sunday evening comes, you start getting that stress, you start thinking about work or school. It's really 1.5, I think. Oh, absolutely. I mean, and you think about it, the, the weekdays with the, with the commuting and just the mental anguish of having that on you, it truly doesn't feel like you own the day because you have to get up at a certain time. You have to do a particular regimen and it's quite disempowering. Mm -hmm. So what happens to a man who has been living on the script for his entire working life? Well, they get trapped. Number one, they get trapped by debt because the script is telling them, if you want to be happy, you need to go out and buy stuff. You need to reward yourself for this work you're doing. You're, you're at work five days a week. So you need to reward yourself with a new car, some nice clothes, you know, the 30 year mortgage and whatnot, and then you'll be fine. But you're told to do that for 50 years and that your big retirement is supposed to happen for 60, you know, at 65, 70 years old, whatever, whatever date they're, they're, they're preaching nowadays. But that also is consistent or contingent on Wall Street. So the script has a bunch of what I call cedars. And there are, there are complicit parties who want you to be abiding by the script because it is very profitable for them. And Wall Street is one of those scripted cedars because the more money is pummeled into Wall Street, the better it is for the people who administer that money. You ever notice that 
the millionaires, like the super millionaires and billionaires, they're not investing in Wall Street like you and I. They're actually the men who are activist investors, guys like Buffett and Ackman, or they're managing the money. They're hedge funders, or they own mutual fund companies. See, the, the big secret is the scripted aren't getting rich following the script. They're getting rich from preaching the script. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. Wow. The, say that again. The, say that part again. The rich aren't getting rich from the script, meaning be cheap, save all your money, save 10% of your paycheck, give it all to Wall Street, trust compound interest for 50 years, and you will eventually be rich. The people that are rich do not follow that advice. And here's a good example. I wrote, this was a, an article or a blog post, not a blog post, but a forum post I wrote. It says, if you want to get rich, you want to get on the cover of Forbes, getting rich, getting on the cover of Forbes, don't take advice from Forbes. And I say that because Forbes was putting out this, you know, this typical compound interest message that was saying, oh, you know, here, look at this chart. If you just, if you start early at 18 and you just keep plowing money into the Wall Street, I call, you know, happy poor, you know, stop, you know, cancel the movie channels, don't buy a new car, do this, do that, live frugal for 50 years, and eventually you'll become a multimillionaire and you'll have this huge portfolio after five decades. Well, this is, now again, this was Forbes putting this out. So I did research to see how many cover models on the Forbes magazine actually followed that advice. You know how many were there? Yeah. None. Yeah. <laughs> so the cover models were actually promulgating the advice. They were the hedge funders, the people that own the mutual funds, the people that prop up that system with whether it's investment firms or banking houses or whatnot. So that's the ultimate hypocrisy. That's one of these hyper realities that the script is pushing out there, according, and also a lot of gurus are pushing it out there because they make a lot of money from it and people do not question it. Where are all the 65 year old multimillionaires? Where are they? If it worked, if it was so successful of a plan, we'd have the world would be filled with 65 year old millionaires. See, in practice, it doesn't really work. In theory, it works. I can give you a piece of pen, uh, a piece of paper and a pen and show you the mathematical calculations. Yes, those work out because that's theory. That's not practice. So why does the script exist then? Why is it here? To keep the system fat. The slaughterhouse needs lambs. The rat race needs rats. And the government needs to continue to print money. It, can, it needs people to continue to consume because it drives the economy. So the system needs those people into the system. And another thing is our, our, our money system is financed on our backs. We can't have a government that prints money unless we have collateral. Well, the collateral used to be gold. It's not gold anymore. It's people. It's citizenship. It's us and our consumption and our voting and, and all the stuff that we plow into the system. That keeps the system alive. It's like the old matrix with the being fed, uh, the machines are being fed by our life force. Well, we have the same construct in the real world. We have our same, we have the same matrix. Yeah. Is there, is there a way to, because you to follow the script and make it work? Because you do have guys like, like Tim Cook, the current CEO of Apple, who was an employee all his life, and Sheryl Sandberg, who's the CEO of Facebook, who was an employee all her life. And, and these people are close. Sheryl Sandberg is a billionaire, and Tim Cook, sure. I think, is worth yes. like 800 million. There's many Google employees, many uh, employees that are in, you know, were in startup roles or have been with these companies that are very innovative that are very, very well off. Absolutely. And so, the, in that way, though, the, it looks like the script did work for them. Yes, the script did work for them. But here's the thing. Lotteries work for some people too. <laughs> you know, multi-level marketing, that works for some people too. What are you going to do if you don't live in Silicon Valley or you don't have a degree from Stanford? <laughs> right, right. See, in my first book, I talk about equations and how we attach ourselves to equations for wealth. Well, if you're in Silicon Valley and you know, you're highly networked and you have a good Stanford connection and, and you're, you're, you're this and that, you attach yourself to a better equation. So in, the, in those cases, those people have done phenomenally well because they're not living by the same script we are. See, their, their mathematical equations for explosive wealth is entirely different for them from Joe Blow on Main Street. It's entirely different from me. Right. 
because they're tied, connected to a scalable entity that can create phenomenal wealth. Yeah. Okay. Do you believe that everyone can get out of this script? Everyone, like on the planet? No, because not everyone wants to. Why would anyone, on- why would any, why would someone not want to? It's, it's pretty clear that working, you know, five days a week at a job you don't like nine, 10 hours plus traffic, you know, having superiors and, and being told when you can and can, you know, go on vacation is, sure. is not that sexy. So why would someone know about the script, educate himself and be aware that the script exists yet not take action and what your book is called become unscripted? Well, first of all, not everyone wants to be an entrepreneur. And I respect that. There are plenty of people who are very happy with their job and I'm not here to change their mind. I'm speaking to the people who demand something else, who can see the script and who can see that, you know, this isn't working for me. I need an alternative. And a lot of times the people that are engaged in the script don't even know, don't even know better. And they just, it's, it's like, how do you, how do you know about a better life if you've never been told about it? And you think this is all there is. But for anyone that wants to escape that kind of dogma, they can do it if they accept the principles that are running the system and how to get away from that system using the power of entrepreneurship. Is entrepreneurship like our natural state as humans? Because jobs, 401ks, Monday through Friday, those never exist. That's You said it's yes. a human thing. So is is entrepreneurship like, were we born to just hustle and, and make it happen for? Isn't, that, isn't entrepreneurship like a part of our survival, like who we are as humans? Absolutely. I believe, I believe that's, you know, if you go back to the, you know, the medieval days or the caveman days or whatever it was, yes, that was our natural state. And then back then you had kings and queens and uh, monarchies who would over, you know, put the populace in slavery. Well, we have the same thing today, except it's a willful slavery. And it's done by the, the script is what administers that slavery. And it's willful. I mean, people don't even know they're doing it, but that's that's how people get entrapped in the system. I mean, college is what I call a leather-lined conveyor belt into the system, because if you're like me, I I had to, you know, take forty thousand dollars in debt in order to get a degree. So that's how the system wants to keep you, you know, trapped to it. But the thing about entrepreneurship, and I think this is very important, is the research has shown that happiness number one contributor to happiness is autonomy. Mm-hmm. And this and this is re, this is disrespective to money. So if you have autonomy, which entrepreneurs do, this is like the big digital nomad thing is, right. you know, that's real big, but you don't even have to be a digital nomad. It's just having the power to dictate, you know, I'm getting up a little late today. I'm going to work 12 hours today, six tomorrow. That kind of autonomy, the research has shown that it has a 50% contributor to happiness, which also brings into the fact that why some people that have jobs, if they have autonomy in their job, they may not want to be an entrepreneur because they have a contributing, they have autonomy contributing to their existence. So they don't necessarily feel the need to be an entrepreneur. Okay. And so for someone who is in college and they're like scratching their head, listening to this, or they're in graduate school, but they don't really know why they're there. They're, they're just there because they feel like they should be there. That's what we know. That's where they should parents. be. But yeah. Parents, their age, society, whatever. And they're studying something like I was like social science, which, you know, I still have a hard time explaining what that is to people. <laughs> uh, yeah. What would you tell them to do? Do you tell them to drop out or would you, would you tell them switch uh, majors? Or? I, I, I can not make those decisions for people. It depends on, you know, college is a growing up experience. So maybe they need to grow up. I don't know. But as far as what to do, whether you're in college or graduated, life is run by a value equation, meaning if you have something that somebody wants, they're going to give you money for it. If you demonstrate relative value, they will give you money for it. Now, when you're, when you're in the exchange of relative value, usually the person receiving it, unless you're a doctor or, or something, is not going to ask you about your college degree. They're not going to ask for your transcripts. You get the money. And that's, and that's a fundamental essence of, uh, of uh, the velocity of money is relative value. Provide relative value on a massive scale, and on a massive scale, money will flow your way. And it's, it's disrespective of a college degree unless, you know, you're in a field 
where you need to have one, such as a doctor, right. you know, an attorney or something. Right. It also disrespective to race, religion, color, sure. all that. It's it's. Do you have value that you can and all an age? I want to throw that in there. It, it, if you have value, then someone you know what, can you can exchange money for that value. Sure. Here here's a good a good analogy I use in my book. It's called the cancer corollary. Okay. If you have cancer and someone has the cure to cancer, you're not going to ask them. Well, how how old are you? Right. Or, uh, you know, uh, or, or where were you born? Or, why do you have wood teeth in one leg? It doesn't matter. Nothing matters, which is which basically narrows down that all our excuses as far as, well, I can't start a business. Right. I don't I can't find any ideas. I'm to this. I'm to that. Those are all self-funded delusions and excuses. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I just watched the uh, did you see the the McDonald's founder? Uh, the, the movie? The, the movie, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I have not. Oh, it's it's a good movie. But yeah, he's, I mean, Ray Kroc was in his, when he was in his 50s, when he was getting started. He yeah. was broke until his 50s and, and started that whole thing. But yeah, I just watched it the other night. Great, great show on entre entrepreneurship and really good. But how, okay, so what's the path here? So I, I think people listening to this, thousands of men, are convinced at some point, or at least there is more interest, there is a heightened interest level in, okay, so I get it. I'm living a script. What do I do? How do, what is the path to become unscripted? Okay. The first aspect is acknowledging the script and, and dissecting it and reverse engineering it. So, you know, when you're being, when you're being exposed to it, once you do that, that's, that's a bunch of belief system changes, exposing the hyper realities. We already talked about some of those money, freedom, the name days. Then everything begins with creating that relative value. You want to be led and that's the biggest question I receive as a founder of the, uh, the Fastlane Forum is wh where do I start? And you always start with the solution you're seeking to solve or the problem you're seeking to solve, the solution that you need to create. And this will lead you the correct direction. And the good example I give is if you're posed with a problem, one plus one, and you don't know the answer, well, the solution to your next step becomes pretty easy. Okay, I need to learn arithmetic. I need to find a book on arithmetic. I need to hire somebody that knows arithmetic. I need to outsource somebody that knows arithmetic. So you want to be led by that problem that you seek to solve. And you do that incrementally until you build your solution. Right. Now, as far as, you know, where, 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 do, I, where do I find, an, you know, a need? Where do I find wants? If you're thinking to yourself, the world is perfect, you're right. There's no, there's no needs. But the world is not perfect. As long as there's an imperfect world, the opportunity to create relative value will always exist. Now, relative value can be dissected in any industry by looking at a, what I call a value array. Now, a value array is the constraints, the attributes you look at when you purchase something. Anytime you open your wallet and someone gives you money, they're saying, congratulations. You won the value competition. In their head, there's a bunch of attributes, price, the way it looks, the way it's packaged, the way the customer service was in the interaction. There's literally dozens and dozens of attributes for each person and each buying decision. So if you're looking to create opportunity, all you do is reverse engineer the value pool for any industry so you can create your unique proposition for creating value. For instance, a company may suck at customer service. Their product is, you know, like in fitness, they have some ingredients that aren't very good. They're artificial. The colors are bad or something. When you reverse engineer that value array, you can create your own value skew and then create your relative value. And then and there you have a business. It's not rocket science. It's pretty simple. And people get in trouble because they think they need to reinvent the wheel. Right, they right. think they need to be the next Uber. Right. And they don't have to be. Right. Yeah, that's what I was going to point out is you can take an existing problem and an existing solution and how can you make it better? How can you provide more value to the person with that struggle or pain? You don't have to create you know, the next Apple or Uber or Airbnb in order to become unscripted. Sure. Any value attributes that you skew, meaning they're better for you, that creates your relative value. Also, just in the in the processes, like if you have a, a better way, I know a ton of people here in San Diego who flip homes 
And so they're they're selling the same product. They they have the same materials in the house. They use the same countertops, everything. But what one person is better at is is acquiring the deals. He's better at building relationships. He's better sure. at actually, you know, acquisitions and that allows him to be three times more successful than someone who has the same product. Absolutely. And that and that is again the value array is being dissected there. The whole value chain is dissected and exposed where value could be created. Another person could get kind of bad deals, not very good deals, but have an incredible stager and that creates their value skew. So that's how you that's how you pretty much, you know, create your own opportunities in industries that appear perhaps saturated. Okay. So, and your book goes in great detail on the path to get out, by the way, all, you know, unscripted and the millionaire fast lane. Are you, okay, I want to come back to this, but are, are you recommending people to just buy unscripted or is what is covered in the millionaire fast lane in unscripted? Is it inside of unscripted or is it now, is it necessary to buy both still? Uh, unscripted is a more holistic type of approach where it's more about life. Actually, I mean, it's, it's mostly about entrepreneurship, but it, it goes into, you know, these dogmatic tenets about life, about how we're, how we fall for them. The Millionaire Fast Lane is more about the mathematics behind it okay, and why people get rich quick, which is possible. People get rich quick all the time. It kind of dives into that and how to create a business just doing that. The scripted is more of a holistic approach okay. just with life in general. Okay. So there is, it is, a, it's a separate book here. All right. Now let's say one reads these books, they read many other books, they, they start taking massive action. They, they get the business, they're, they're making money. Okay. Things are going well. Now I have seen this where it's almost like there's a script for the entrepreneur where now he is just working his tail off. And he's making a lot. He's making more money than he's ever made. And there's this sort of addiction to what you've got, become good at. So where you're you're actually working more now. Like it's it's mm -hmm. not even f sacrificing five for two. You're just going all in with seven. <laughs> sure. And you're just kind of in this entrepreneurial rat race. And I think that's where a lot of this would be another group of guys who are listening. Where it's like, yeah, that's where I am. I have a business. I've been doing it. Things are going well, but I'm I'm not free. Uh, I don't have that unscripted life. Well, what you have to ask those people, what is the end game? Yeah. What What is your end game? There are, I mean, I'm pretty sure Elon Musk has a life like that, but he loves what he, he yeah. probably loves what he does. Right. And he can afford to love what he does because, you know, he's a billionaire. So it really depends on what someone's objective is and long-term goal is. For me, I knew I wanted to write and I wanted to write without the the forbearance of money, meaning... I didn't want to worry about who I would piss off and, you know, what publishers say, oh, you can't sell that. I wanted to write without having to worry about that. So I had an exit plan that I didn't want to be working seven days a week, you know, over and over again. So I made a conscious choice to when my company was profiting six figures a month to save most of it because I knew I wanted to be completely free, completely autonomous to retire and retirement's another scripted tenant where people think retirement is 65 and you sit around and do nothing. No, retirement can be whatever you want it to be. For me, it's writing. It's for me, it's running a forum, taking, you know, doing whatever I want to do. So it really depends on the person and what they're happy, happiness, what they're happy about. If they're not happy doing that seven days a week, ultimately that's what it became for me. I mean, I was happy doing what I was doing, but then it became a grind. And that's right. when I knew I had to sell the company. Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like getting clear on the end game and having a, a, a goal. It's like, all right, because at first you're trying to get away from the scripted lifestyle and finally you do. And then it's hard to walk away when you're, when you're so, when you're good at it. It's like you've, you've developed this skill set. It's like, you're almost one of the only people who can do what you do and you're making a lot of money. And it's like taking time off from work is now a challenge because you're capable, your earning potential is so high. But you also have to realize if you did it before, you can probably do it again. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. that's why people become serial entrepreneurs because they sell the company. They take a break and they say, well, you know, I need a new challenge. I need a new problem to solve. And they go do that. So that's why it's kind of different for every person. Some person may be like me and say, no, I would like to, you know, I would like to write or I would like to try to produce movies and get a screenwriting contract or something. It depends on the person. 
And I like to say that as far as the balance goes, balance is bullshit. So you have to wander into the land of the obsessed in order to create a balanced life. It's kind of like a roller coaster. Yeah. Okay. So when I say to my, when I think to myself, you know, the great life I have now is because of imbalance, not because, oh, I lead a balanced life. No, because <laughs> it's because I wandered into the obsessed and the imbalanced and now I have balance. Yeah. There's this quote, I think it's the road to excess leads to the palace of wisdom. It's one of those mm. like 18th, 19th century philosophers. <laughs> okay. So now you, you got the bills, you got the business, you got the goal. Okay. So I got my clear end goal of where I want to go. I want to get free from this thing. What advice do you have to that person who wants to get free, but feels like they can't like, what is it? Do they need to hire more people? Do they need to replace themselves or do they sell the business? What are some of these exit strategies available to these business owners? Well, it's company. Obviously, that's company specific. But if if an exit is the plan, then you have to make your company attractive for a potential acquirer, and that's usually like a private equity company or or a lot of actually a lot of entrepreneurs have enough money nowadays that they go actually buy companies because there's been so many great stories. But it depends on what you know, the industry is and what the, you know, what the goal is there, but you would have to make it a, attractive to an, to a, an acquirer. Okay. So it sounds like the business needs to, you know, have the right people in place so that work can run on its own. Like you're not the main person. Yeah. That, I mean, that always helps when, when the person that's acquiring your company sees that it's not, you're not the company. Right. So my company the second time, that was kind of an issue that lowered my, lowered the valuation because I was had my hands in so much stuff. Right. But that is not necessarily a requirement. All you have to do is get an investment banker that will shop it around. Even if that's a problem, you still can have someone shop the company or you can put it on, you know, any of the lists or the the websites that sell companies. Got it. Got it. Okay. And what about if you just want to keep your business? We're selling, you don't want to sell it. You want to keep it because it produces great income and it could be a great cash flow producing asset, something that's in your arsenal of assets. So when you're hiring an integrator, someone who's going to take over this company, do you pay him a lot of money? Do you overpay him so he stays? Like, how do you keep him from just not, <laughs> how do you keep him from leaving? How do you keep him from trying to take your company? Do you give him equity? Are you big on equity? I, I know Felix Dennis has a book about how to get rich and he says, never, never. He has this whole chapter on never giving away one percentage. What are your mm -hmm. thoughts on that? I never gave up equity ever, but I am all for doing doing what it takes to make your company attractive or to free yourself from, you know, the nine to five or in, in some cases, if it's an entrepreneur doing seven and zero. <laughs> right, uh, that's I, I overpaid all my employees because they were that valuable to me because they were freeing up my time. The idea of having to replace them, train them. Yeah. So I always look for somebody, one of my best employees was a someone who had no interest in being an entrepreneur, but she was extremely loyal, you know, reliable. And I paid her a hell of a lot more than I needed to because she was that valuable. And you have to pay your people what they're worth, even more so what they're worth. So they stay loyal and reliable to you. Okay. Yeah. I like that. I like that. And have you, so you've been around, you, you know, created this community, you've attracted a lot of uh, high level entrepreneurs from, from all different you know stages in their journey to you. And I'm sure you've surrounded yourself with some very high level people just, you know, on your own journey as well with entrepreneurship. Have you noticed a difference in happiness, quality of life from a guy who's netting? So netting at the end of the year, let's just say like low six figures, let's say 250K net after taxes. Versus the guy who's doing significantly more, seven figures net. So let's say he's doing two million net versus the guy who's doing 10 million net. Like mm -hmm. we're looking at happiness, quality of life, and autonomy. All three of them are unscripted. They're, they're, they're running their businesses. But when we look at like what really matters here or what I believe is important, happiness and freedom and quality of life. And what are your thoughts on that? As far as what the difference is? Is there? Do I see any differences? Yeah. Do you do you see a difference there? Of course there's differences because everyone is driven. Everyone has a different meaning and purpose. Okay. The, the guy with $10 million in sales and maybe he's netting $5 million a year, he may like that ego. He may like 
the money coming in and, and, you know, the seven, I mean, I'll be honest with you, I work seven days a week still periodically, but it doesn't feel like work to me. So there's a difference there. If, if it doesn't feel like work, is it work? And that's part of the autonomy equation is when you have that autonomy, suddenly work doesn't seem like work. Even when it's, you know, stuff you would rather not do, there's, you still have the power of your own choices. Uh, Confucius says, like, choose a job you love and you'll never have to work a day in your life. Can you explain that a bit more? He says, I think a lot of people might have been shocked. It's like, oh, this guy just wrote the book unscripted. He's working seven days a week. But you did just say it doesn't feel like work. Can you explain a little bit more on that? Because it's it's self-endorsed work that I want to do. It's a full it's a choice. I, I mean, I'm having this interview with you because it was my choice. Yeah. No, no one was, I, I don't have a mortgage to pay or a car payment to make. And I, and, oh my God, I better interview, uh, you know, book sales are down or, <laughs> or, or my forum traffic is, is declining. I better, right, I, there's right, no need, right. there's no need for me to do it. Right. So I do, my work now is endorsed, self-endorsed work where that I do it, that fulfills my soul. It's, you could say I'm following my passion and I can afford to follow my passion regardless if money flows or not. And that's a, that's a big distinction because in my opinion, follow your passion is the biggest bullshit story ever told to entrepreneurs. And people don't like when I say that, but, you know, I wholeheartedly believe it. And I think people are led astray when they're told to follow their passion because, sorry, passion does not pay bills. Try paying your mortgage with passion. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't work. I don't think my uh, landlord is going to accept it. But what do you think about a guy like Steve Jobs who said in his speech that that was one of his key tenets was following your passion. It allows you to do work that you know most people wouldn't do. Warren Buffett has been quoted saying this and, and many other you know of the richest people have said that it's sure. important. And I believe they wholeheartedly believe that. I believe they believe that. But I don't think they've really thought about it too in depth like like I have. And what happens is when Steve Steve Jobs actually said, love what you do. So think about it. Do you think Steve Jobs would have said that if he f was a consummate failure his entire life and did not and was not speaking to Stanford students? Would he be saying that? Yeah. yeah. First of all, he would have no audience to say that to. Right. right. And see what what's happening here, in my opinion, is when you connect a feedback loop meaning people value your value, you will love what you do. I mean, that's the feedback loop. The feedback loop is when someone tells you, hey, your book changed my life. You told me that before we we yeah, even got on yeah, the air. I did. That to me is incredibly fulfilling. That's, that's where passion is generated. That's where love what you do comes into play. And the best example I have of this is there are hundreds of thousands of blogs with two or three posts, you know, then, then they're abandoned. Well, you know damn well every person that ever started a blog was passionate about it. You don't start a blog unless you're passionate about it. So why have they quit? Why have they quit? 97, 98, 99% have quit writing after two or three posts. <laughs> well, because their feedback loop was never connected. So what if you wrote your first blog post and it was shared 10,000 times. Yeah, you're yeah. going to keep going. 100,000 likes. You think you would love what you do? You think you would start saying, oh, I love this. This is great. <laughs> of course you are because your feedback loop is firing. Jobs created a billion trillion dollar company. Of course he loves what he does. Buffett is worth $74 billion. Of course he, love what he, he loves what he does because – he is good at it, and the marketplace <laughs> has told him, right. damn, Warren, you're, you're awesome. Here's $50,000. I'm going to go to lunch with you. You think that's going to make you love what you do? <laughs> so what, is, what does someone do when that feedback loop is not firing? They're not getting that stimulus feedback from people, and they're producing either work, creative work or they're, they're launching products but with, you know, with crickets. Well, you have to understand, first of all, knowledge of that feedback loop is incredibly powerful. So I always say you work to the echo. Work until you start getting that feedback loop. Now the feedback loop can be other things. It could be it could be someone emailing you saying you suck. It could be someone laughing at you. It could be bad. It's a variety of things. But this is where entrepreneurs fail because the feedback loop does not fire. And they say, "Oh boy, well, 
I guess this doesn't work. Let's go on to the next shiny, you know, the, the shiny object syndrome. So once you have knowledge of that feedback loop, you can tell yourself, you can convince yourself, okay, well, I am going to work until I get the feedback loop kicking. And that's when you do what I call the three A's. You act, you assess, and then you adjust. So when the feedback loop comes in, fires, you look at the assess. You say, hey, what is this? Okay, what do I need to do here? Is this someone telling me that the product is no good? Is it too expensive? Then you adjust, make your adjustment, and then you go from there. I like that. Work until the feedback loop kicks in. Don't give up until it. it's kind of like when that when it kicks in, like that's going to give you a big a big boost. And, of, and like I said, it might not even be positive. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to think right now. Like I'm thinking about. I'm trying to relate. You know, my story. My you know, my, my listeners know my story. And, and when I first started, it, then nothing really happened. It was crickets. But I kept pushing. <laughs> I kept pushing, and I got a lot of criticism for being someone who was. I think young with this whole knowledge for men brand and really was not good at all. I was getting one star reviews on the podcast and it was tough, but sooner or later I started getting people who were saying that, Hey man, that episode changed my life or Hey, I quit my job. I started ah. this thing. I broke up with my girlfriend. I'm now dating this girl that I'm, I'm, I'm going to, you know, I, I'm, I want to marry. Like I made an impact. And when those started coming, I just started listening to those and, and, and those were like the much needed boosts that kept, you know, this is going to be Absolutely. episode over 350. And it's, you know, I think those feedback, I, I totally get it. And I agree. I mean, and, and think about it. What if you never got out of that negative feedback? Yeah. One star reviews every damn time. No <laughs> listeners. Well, you, you're going to quit at that point, right. And you may actually, you, you'll never get to the point to say, hey, love what you do. <laughs> because... Because now you love what you do because you're seeing the impact that you have provided. Right. You have provided relative value to millions of men. Right. So now that 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 is incredibly powerful, and I think that's why too many entrepreneurs quit too early, and uh, you know they they fall to that shiny object syndrome where they just yeah. oh yeah absolutely. <laughs> what is the unscripted life like for you? If you could walk us through, you said you work seven days, but like, what does the life, what does the day to day, what does the unscripted life look like for you? For me, it's get up whenever you want, do whatever, do whatever you want, go to the gym whenever you want, travel whenever you want, work whenever you want. It's basically doing whatever you want. Now, I admit in the last year, I haven't, I haven't done a lot of that because I've been working on this book, but that in effect is what it is. And for everyone, it's going to be different. Uh, I have a friend who owns an e-commerce company. He's on the road, not on the road, he's in a plane six months out of a year traveling. And yet he does extremely well, you know, has no debt. And for him, his his version of abundance is travel. For me, it's freedom. It's being able to do whatever, whenever, wherever. I like that. When when you say this and, and, and you look back at what you, you've done in this, I want to say movement in that you've really sparked and inspired many entrepreneurs and people in the scripted life to become unscripted and, and to build freedom for others. What was it like when you didn't have this, you were working and you, you were in the scripted life. What was life like for you back then? Yeah. Uh, you have to go back. 20... You've, been, you've been doing this. Yeah. Cause the whole limo. Yeah. Yeah. I you've mean, you have to go back. <laughs> I, 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 I kind of, for, I kind of forgot what that was like. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you know, I just think it's it's always, you know, I, I get so many, you know, great guys like yourself on the show and sometimes just to ask them like, hey man, like what do you remember what it was like when you were living this other life and, and look at all the things you've done and, and, oh, and all the people you've impacted. It's it's like wow. <laughs> like, I remember having to get up at four in the morning, getting in traffic because I because I drove a limousine in Chicago, glorified taxi, and I just remember getting up at four in the morning and just you know, this, that was a seven day week job too. And it sucked because all it did was pay the bills until next month. And then you repeat, but I was still an entrepreneur at heart. I always was an entrepreneur at heart. That's why I actually took that job because I thought starting a limousine business would be the business that I would want to do. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know those, uh, those 4 a.m. mornings all too well, uh, having worked at a, I was a, I was a manager at a retail store before I, uh, I read your book. I just want to share real briefly. When I got your book, it was just recommended through some entrepreneur group I was attending and I bought it and buying a book for me was a, was a big, 
deal because I was not, I didn't read really. And it was just, that was a big deal for me to go out and buy a book. Uh, you, but what's funny is when you're in college, you buy books all the time. You don't even think about it. But when it's a book about yourself, it was, it was tough for me. I remember when I got the book and I read the first chapter that that book was like going in the ring with Muhammad Ali. Like I was just getting knocked out, punched in the face left and right. <laughs> it was just waking and shaking me. And you know, I would, I would put it down, I go to work and then I just couldn't stop thinking about it. And then I, I would be looking forward to reading that book. Cause I read a lot of books mm -hmm. like, you know, posts like since then, but that book, I remember looking forward to like, you know, when you set up a, a date with a girl and everything's going great, like you're, you're calling, you're texting yeah. and, and you know, the date's going to happen. And you just can't wait for that date. It was like, I had to date with this book and I just couldn't wait to, <laughs> to get in the ring again, even though I was going to get punched. And you know, what it showed me was a tactical way to, to me, it, it just showed me like, look, this is, it was a, it was a real map of, of what you need to know and, and how you can get there. Yeah. Versus a lot of books that just were selling the idea and I would be excited about the idea, but I didn't have the necessary tools to, to actually do it. In addition, you have a community that just supports the book and, and further shows that it's, you know, it, it's validated and many yeah. people have done it. But yeah, I just wanted to share that with you because that, that was my experience. And I did quit in addition to many other resources that were helping me at that time. But that, that was, uh, you know, pivotal, pivotal in helping me uh, do this thing. And, I, and I'm, I've been free for the last, I would say the first year I was broke. And then the, the, <laughs> three, the last three years I've been free and, and doing this full time and make significantly more than when I was a, a retail manager. Well, thanks for firing my feedback loop. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and put, point of point of information for anyone in your audience who has not read either book, it is kind of brash and brunt, and some people take offense to that. And just want to clarify, it's like that because I'm yelling at my younger self. This, these are the books I wish I had when I was 21. Yeah. So I'm writing to myself in in kind of a respect, which is why. I can be so tearless because I'm just yelling at my younger self, you know, you know, slapping me in the face, you know, wake up, wake up. This is what you need to do. Yeah. I, you destroyed every sort of belief I had around. I, I used to cut coupons. Like I used to do that with my, with my family on Sunday morning in the paper. I remember my, I love my dad a, a lot, but he would, he would show me that, you know, you, you can become wealthy through a mutual fund. And I really believe those things. And that was, mm. that was going to be what I was going to, I was going to do that. And I would try and reduce going to Starbucks. I would do these little things that never made me money. It just subtracted, it just, yeah. it's just saving money that I didn't even have. Basically. Once you tap yourself into that equation, you see that creating wealth is, it's not this long 50 year ride. I mean, it could happen. People become millionaires very quickly, a couple of years. A good example is when, I, when my Fastlane was first released years ago, I did the pod, Pat Flynn podcast. Okay. And, you know, he was doing his little income reports type of thing. Right. And I was trying to tell him that, you know, you'll see the stock market is an impotent vehicle for wealth. You'll see. And I think at the time is, you know, his income report was, I don't know, $16,000 a month. Now it's 250000 a month. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's insane. <laughs> I mean, I wonder if he's fretting about the stock market. Yeah. Yeah. You just create it. Yeah, absolutely. Let's dive into the knowledge. I just have a few last questions here for you. Just kind of short responses and then uh, we'll wrap up here. So you're ready for the knowledge round, MJ. Yeah, let's roll. <laughs> All right. What, what advice would you give to someone who's feeling really lost right now from this whole show and, and they would like what they're hearing? They're going to get your book. They just don't know where to start. Well, the first advice is read the book. And then if you still don't know what to, still don't know where to start, you need to reread the book <laughs> because that's why it took so long because I wanted someone to read it. And if they comprehend it, they can say, okay, it is quite clear what I need to do now. Yeah. Cause there's a roadmap in there. Now I can't connect the dots in between the cities, but I can get you to the promised land with each city outlined, but I can't get you, I can't do the ride for you. Yeah. What do you think is holding most men back from taking action on building that business that they want to build? So they, they have said yes to the unscripted life. They want to do this, but they can't get themselves to take the risk. They can't get themselves to show up each day and, and take those rejections, et cetera. Well, then they would have to dig deeper to find a better purpose. Everything, we're all driven by a meaning and purpose. 
And one of the sayings I say in my book is, if you show me a man who is comfortable, and I will show you a man who will not work to improve his situation. Mm. And that's the problem, mediocre comfort. Well, you know, life is pretty comfortable. So when life is pretty comfortable, I can guarantee you it's going to be much easier to watch the NBA playoffs than it is to actually turn the TV off and do the research on a value equation or a value array in an industry to find your need. Yeah, very good. And so your two books here, Unscripted and The Millionaire Fast Lane, I want to give credit to those who have been doing it this whole time. But what have been three of your most influential books that have helped you on your entrepreneurial journey? Back when I was suicidal, when I was, I don't know, 19, 20 years old, it was Awaken the Giant by Tony Robbins. Very old book, but very thick and detailed. Zero to One is good. And Compound Effect. Zero to One, Peter Thiel. Is that right? Yes. Compound Effect, Darren Hardy. You got it. All right. Great. Great. All right. And so now imagine you had 60 seconds with your 25 year old self. If you can envision where 25 year old MJ is today, knowing what you now know today, what would you tell him to do? What would you tell him not to do? Stop following passion and start following need. And is anything else? Beware of <laughs> advice from questionable sources. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what, what is your biggest eyebrow lifter to a questionable source? What, what are those signs? Taking advice from people, taking financial advice from people who are not in a good financial situation, <laughs> or I say taking advice from broke brokers. <laughs> right. If you if you go on you know Amazon and look on your conventional money and stuff, finance investing, most of those books, the people, the guys that are discussing that aren't rich, so they're like a you you can't be a champion swimmer and be refuse to get into the pool. So you have to make sure the people you're taking advice from have the type of life you aspire to have instead of you know regurgitating textbook theories and you know whatnot another thing is do they practice what they preach yeah are they rich from what they're teaching you in this book more than often than not they're not yeah all right really good all right and and just uh, even if you have to summarize some of your main points here what would you say is your philosophy on uh, life and success control your own destiny skin your own game don't rely on anybody have autonomy I think that was the most happiest point in my life is when I knew I didn't need a job for at least a year. Bills were covered, cracked the nut on finding customers, wasn't rich, didn't have a lot of money at the time, but I had autonomy. It was really a moment that sparked happiness, and that happiness has never faded. It has only gotten better. It gets better when you you know start acquiring some cash and some surplus funds. So you should work toward autonomy and getting out of debt is the first step for people who are entrapped in scripted living. Yeah. All right. And what's, what are you most excited about kind of in this year here? So you got the book coming out. Is there anything else you're working on? Is it, is it, is it all attention on this book or any other side projects? To be honest, it's my health. I haven't, I haven't been feeling well <laughs> lately. So I, I need to get that squared away because health is everything. If you don't have health, yeah. you know, everything else is pretty much inconsequential. And I noticed when I was, there were some days I wasn't feeling well and you realize you don't care about anything. You don't care about a book. You don't right. care about who's on the forum talking shit. I mean, you <laughs> just don't care about anything. So yeah, you can't enjoy the unscripted life without your health. Yes. And that's, that's another reason why we want to get unscripted because you don't want to wait till you're 65 to enjoy something that may not be there. Right. All right. All right. I think we've we've covered so many bases. It's been an honor having you here on the show, MJ, and it really has played a big role in, in me taking the leap. And and I'm I'm really excited. I just got the book. I'm I'm really excited to dive through this. It's I've got a stack of like 20 books that I'm gonna read, and and this just got it today, and it it, it jumped straight. It's it got expedited to the top. Ah, yes. <laughs> um, feedback loop. Feedback loop. <laughs> it really did. And so for the listeners. You can you can go check out Millionaire Fastlane. There's a forum, a community of people who who have read the book and, and take action on the book. And then go to uh, Amazon. You can type in MJ DeMarco or just type in Millionaire Fastlane for his first book, which which I really recommend you read. I know the the new one just came out, but but Millionaire Fastlane was the one that I read that played a big role. And I I'm gonna dive through Unscripted, which I'm really excited for. And I hope you guys go and check out and get started on the path to life, liberty, and the pursuit of entrepreneurship with MJ DeMarco. MJ, I've loved this interview and I'm going to re-listen to this as soon as I'm done. All right, dude, man, I had a blast. Thanks for having me. 
Thank you for listening to the Knowledge for Men podcast. Hundreds of interviews and millions of downloads later, we're continuing to build an international movement and we're just getting started. So if you enjoyed this episode, go ahead and leave a helpful review in iTunes because it really helps the podcast grow so we can impact even more men in the world who need this. Guys, this is all about living with purpose, where every day you only do things that matter to you. You wake up, live with purpose, and take massive action towards the life you want. And always remember, love the life you have while creating the life of your dreams. Go to kfmfree.com to get a surprise bonus I've made for my listeners. Again, that's kfmfree.com for something that's changed my life, and I'm offering it to you for free. Also, check out my Amazon best-selling books that I've written for you to help you crush life at kfmauthor.com. Again, that's kfmauthor.com to see all the books I've created to help you break through in life. This is your host, Andrew Farabee, founder of knowledgeformen.com, and I'll see you in the next episode.